Good morning, church. Allow me a couple of commercials as we begin uh, this morning. First of all, if you are a guest today, um, there are cards in the seat backs in front of you. If you would fill one of those out so we can have your name and little basic information, that would greatly help us to welcome you well. Also, uh, if you add to your prayer list the youth group as they get ready to travel next weekend, uh, there'll be a chunk of people not here, about 30 or so is my understanding, heading to uh, CYC next weekend. Um, if you wonder what in the world is that, that's Challenge Youth Conference in, I think it's Sevierville. Is it Sevierville? Where is it? Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Uh, Bill. They'll be uh, making up a group of over 10,000, at least, that, uh, that meet annually in that youth conference, and uh, we're excited for them to have that time. Please pray for their safety, and they'll have a great weekend. Also, uh, appreciate the, the portion of the prayer dedicated to our s process of selecting additional elders. I want to remind you of that. Uh, in the back, there are forms where you can nominate men you feel are qualified and willing to serve, and um, we're in the, the nomination process, I, I guess you could say, and there's a form, and then there's a box to place those in, or you can hand that to any of the leaders uh, here, and hope you're uh, really thinking about and praying about that as we go through that. Very important. It said that uh, some Christians have a type of religion in which people get saved in the spring, grow cold in the summer, backslide in the autumn, and fall away completely in the winter. And then they get saved again all over in the spring revival. Story goes that there was a revival years ago that had gone on for about 10 days and people knew it was sort of reaching its height and a certain man who came into the tent, they were having a revival in a tent and um, came in, sat in the back row one night and the next night he, he moved about halfway up toward the front and then the third night there he was sitting in the very front row. And the fourth night he, he broke out in prayer and and he was saying, Lord, fill me. He just kept repeating, Lord, fill me. And over to the side of him, there was a woman who knew him all too well. And she added her prayer, careful, Lord, he leaks. Well, be that as it may, have you ever experienced a great revival? Now, depending on where you're from and your uh, preferred language, you may call it a, a special meeting or a gospel meeting. You may call it a revival. Uh, but have you ever been a part of one, a really good one? And what is it that makes it good or not so good? Now, is it the preacher? Is it the singing uh, the music or the way people are responding, that probably varies from person to person as well, doesn't it? What is it that makes a particular sermon one that you either like or don't like? One that really motivates you or maybe bores you to tears? Again, that would probably have a lot to do with personal preferences, wouldn't it? Uh, one of the conceits that a preacher has to get over very early in his preaching ministry is the idea that, that everyone's just going to really love his preaching. And, you know, you have to realize that that just ain't true if you, if you want to survive. And so I know that I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And there's likely people here... Uh, that I'm not their cup of tea, and God bless you for being here anyway. Um, I've been at this long enough to be okay with that. 
But I'd suggest to you that if we could have the Apostle Paul himself here in a gospel meeting or revival, that at least a, a significant number of us wouldn't prefer his type of preaching. Maybe even a majority of us. You find that hard to believe? I'll tell you, you read his letters in the New Testament, there were a lot of people that were not fans of Paul. A lot of people who didn't care for his style. Did you know that there were even people who fell asleep on the great preacher, Paul? Well, it's true. I was teaching a course at Ohio Valley University one semester. The course was on the book of Acts, and our practice was every week, you know, there was a reading assignment in Acts, and, and then when you have a quiz or a test on that particular reading, and one time we had a quiz, and, and the following question was on the quiz. The question said, did anyone ever fall asleep when the Apostle Paul was preaching, yes or no? Well, I quickly found out who had read their assignment that week and who had not. So I'd like us to, uh, to read a few verses from Acts chapter 20 together and see what the right answer to that question is, okay? Acts chapter 20, we're going to read beginning at verse 7 down through verse 12. It says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Now, a couple things about this paragraph so we can understand what's going on here before we apply it. This event occurs in the ancient city of Troas, takes place on Paul's third missionary journey. The mission team is on their way back um, from their outward journey. They've been in Greece in places like Athens and Corinth and on their way back they stop in the city of Troas where there was a church although it's probably a church that Paul wasn't the the, the founding missionary of uh, because on his previous journey the spirit had actually prevented him from staying there for uh, very long at all you noticed I hope as we read there that um, the writer of Acts, Luke, keeps using the pronoun we as he tells this story. You see, Luke is with Paul at this point in his travels. And, and so what we get in Acts 20, verses 7 through 12, is an eyewitness account. And uh, even more, we get an eyewitness account by a trained doctor. Remember that Luke is... Um, known as the beloved physician. And I think that's significant for what happens as well. So what is it that, that takes place here at Troas on this occasion? Well, I would describe it as one great revival. And that's just one of the things. Now, it may not be the kind of revival that we were referring to uh, at the beginning 
this morning, but it's certainly a revival. And I would bet that this revival had an impact on everybody that witnessed it in a way that they never forgot. And probably many who heard it never forgot about it, don't you? Look at this paragraph again in Acts 20. And, and try, try and let sink in a little bit more today what Luke says. He begins, On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. I hope you appreciate the fact that 2,000 years ago, Christians assembled on the first day of the week, Sunday, to worship. Uh, two of the elements of that worship, perhaps three, are, are mentioned here in these few verses that we read. The breaking of bread uh, is the Lord's Supper. And, and then we have the study and the preaching of the Word of God by Paul. And then I think also implied at least is prayer. So Christians have been doing that for 2,000 years, and, and Christians have done it today, and Christians always will. There's a reason that we assemble on the first day of the week. It's always been the day of the worship assembly. It's always been the Lord's day. Um, John, the inspired writer, calls it that over in first chapter of Revelation, verse 10, the Lord's day. The first day of the week has always been the day that Jesus was raised. And so why would Christians not worship on his day, on the Lord's day? Why would it not be the day to observe the supper that, that he founded, which remembers the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. Now, I know in some quarters it's fashionable, and some indeed mock and scorn those who would quote Acts 20 and verse 7 as a precedent and an example for taking the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. I've, I've heard people do that. In fact, I've heard them do it at me. But I always have a question for them. Just call it the smart aleck in me. In their churches, I will guarantee you that every first day of the week, they will take up a money collection of some sort. But there is no more and no less scripture for that act of worship, giving, than there is for the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. Uh, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Again, the same person, Paul, is uh, actually writing that letter, and he tells the Corinthians that on the first day of the week, when they assemble as a church, that they should set aside money as they have prepared to, to be uh, collected. Sounds so much like what we read in Acts 20 and verse 7 and the Lord's Supper. Why would people be more interested in collecting money than taking the Lord's Supper? Just something that occurs to me. Anyway, in addition to communing together, the church listened to Paul. Listened to him preach, right? On this occasion, Acts 20. In fact, it says that, that Paul talked with them, which may imply a, a bit of a less formal kind of uh, preaching than we're used to, where there's actually some give and take going on. The word that is used there to describe it uh, is that Paul dialogued with them. But then Paul makes what might be called a, a fatal mistake, at least for one person. He prolonged his speech until midnight. 
Can you believe the gall of the apostle to preach that long? To preach until midnight? We would squirm. What is it? 10 till 11? We would squirm if, if one preached until noon today. But till midnight? Till midnight? Now to make more sense of it, their meeting likely did not occur until sundown on this occasion. In the early days, you know, even though the, the church did observe the practice of worshiping on Sunday, the first day of the week, the world didn't really know about that. The world didn't consider that a particularly special day, the first day of the week. Sunday was not a day off for workers and for slaves and so forth. And so the church, we think, met either very early before uh, dawn or very late after the workday was over. And that seems to be the case here. We might imagine that they get together at six or seven or eight in the evening and and they met then for Lord's Day worship and they prayed and they took the Lord's Supper. And uh, at some point, Paul began talking with them. And he just kept on going until midnight. It's dark outside. They're assembled in, in an upper room of a three-story building without much ventilation, full of lamps to give them some light. And I imagine, don't you, that the room is pretty full for the opportunity to hear Paul. And you know, I, I'm pretty confident that they didn't have central air in Troas. And probably not even hand fans, which we had before central air. Did you realize it's possible for the church to meet without those amenities? I know you do. Because you were here during 2020 when we met out there with no central air in the parking lot. Some Sundays, it was very hot. We learned to wear hats, right, Steve? And then... Six months later, it got a little cold. Lord really blessed us with pretty good weather all through that period, but there were some days where it wasn't so comfortable. We learned we could do that. But I noticed when we could, we came back inside. Luke, the physician, again, an eyewitness to all of this, says that there was a young man Verse 12, he's called a youth, which is probably a signal to us that he's a boy. He's got a very interesting name. You might call it ironic. You know what his name is? Lucky. Now, I know it says in your translation, Eutychus. They've just brought the name over from the original language. Uh, but that Greek word means fortunate one or lucky one. I wonder how many today would consider him lucky. First of all, he is at church. And then he's at church at night. Can you believe they had to assemble for worship at night on Sunday in the earliest church? I mean, obviously, that's asking a lot of people. But Lucky was there at nine or ten years old, and so was Paul, the, the great worldwide missionary, and Luke, the highly trained, highly educated doctor. Can you imagine people like that at church on Sunday night? But that's the case. You know, didn't they have better things to do? I mean, they had worked hard all week. In fact, they had likely worked hard all day. That day. 
and then to stay so long. Paul talks on until midnight. And Lucky falls asleep into a deep sleep, Luke tells us. Look at verse 9. And he's sitting by the, by the window in the upper room, three stories above street level, and he falls out that window. And Luke clearly tells us in verse 9 that Eutychus, lucky, is in fact Necros, dead from the fall. When I read that story, I think, wow. I put my fair share of people to sleep when I've preached. I don't think I've ever killed anybody yet. And I hope I never do. Because if I ever do, one thing I know, I can't do what the Apostle Paul did about it. Poor, sleepy Eutychus, a sitting without squirming, perching on a window ledge, to hear an endless sermon. Now his eyes are droopy, sitting way up high. Poor sleepy Eutychus is just about to die. The Apostle Paul keeps on a preaching to our hero snoozing hard. Then Eudy leans into the air and crashes in the yard. But Paul is an apostle. Quite unlike other men, down he runs to Eutychus and gives him life again. So if you're going to sleep in church, don't from a window fall. The man up front of preaching is not the Apostle Paul. <laughs> Paul goes down to the street, bends over the boy, takes him in his arms, and revives him. And that's what I meant today by one great revival. Eutychus was fortunate that Paul was there. In fact, he was even more so fortunate, blessed, that the God he worshipped that Lord's Day the God whose son he remembered as he took the bread and the cup was a God who raises people from the dead. When Lucky fell out the window that evening, people may have felt fortunate that there was a doctor in the house, that Luke was there, but there was no doctor. No doctor alive who could do what needed done for that boy's broken body. But there was a preacher there who proclaimed a God who had experience in dealing with broken bodies. Even the broken body of his own son, Jesus. And so God worked through Paul that night and there occurred in the Church of Christ at Troas that evening one great revival. In fact, Paul continued. Did you notice? He continued his meeting with the church there for another six hours or so until daybreak. And then he left and he moved on to other fields. That's maybe one of the most amazing parts of the story. After that event, they just went back up and kept on worshiping. But the church, the text says, was greatly comforted as a result of what happened. They were encouraged, cheered up. In short, they were revived. And folks, that happens any time the church truly worships. Any time the church truly worships and remembers that we serve the God of life, revival 
is available. So I encourage you this morning to be revived. Let's pray. Holy God, we bow in your presence, grateful for every blessing, just the opportunity to assemble on your day and honor your name. Thank you for each person here. We know each person brings their own need and, um, and request, and we pray in your wisdom you will grant those blessings and that we will be grateful and thankful for every good thing that comes from you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life, his death for us, and the fact that you revived him and raised him and promise us the same thing if we will be in him. Thank you for hearing us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, we thank you for being in assembly today, for listening for these moments, and pray that you've been encouraged in your faith. If we need to minister to you further in some way, maybe to pray specifically for something for you, or maybe if there's somebody here, uh, like last Lord's Day, that needs to meet the Lord in gospel obedience in the waters of baptism, all those things are ready, and uh, we can... We can help you now or at any time, please let us know what it might be that you need while together we stand and sing this song.